What exactly is pain? Seems like a silly question, doesn't it? We all experience pain, but what's going on in our bodies when pain happens? What are the mechanisms that allow us to experience pain? What is pain for? What purpose does it serve? And finally, most important to so many of us, how can we make it stop? First, let's talk about what pain is from a medical point of view. Pain is defined as a localized sensation of discomfort or distress resulting from the stimulation of specialized nerve endings. In other words, we define pain first and foremost as a neurological issue. We're going to see in a few moments how it's a bit more complex than that, but for now let's look at the neurology of pain. Any sensation of pain begins with the activation of specialized neurons at the site of the injury. Now, as you probably know, we usually divide neurons or nerve cells into three broad types. They're autonomic neurons, which take care of the automatic processes for our bodies, like breathing, digestion, heart rate, and so on. There are motor neurons, which control movement, and sensory neurons, which transmit information from our senses, sight, hearing, touch, and all the rest. Pain, obviously, is a sensory process and it's transmitted by sensory neurons. More specifically, pain is transmitted by a subtype of sensory neurons called nociceptors, which comes from the Latin noci for hurt. It's related to the word noxious, which is why you'll sometimes hear pain researchers refer to noxious stimuli. Those are stimuli that cause pain. Nociceptors can be further divided into several different types, each of which responds to a different type of pain pressure, heat, cuts, inflammation, even chemical changes. There are also fast and slow types of nociceptors. Fast nociceptors respond to severe pain. Slow nociceptors transmit information about dull or aching pain. In other words, the more urgent the information, the faster it travels. Nociceptors can be found anywhere in the body that may be affected by something harmful or by internal injury. That includes the skin, the muscles, bones, joints, internal organs, and the serous membranes. Those are the protective membranes that surround internal organs. Nociceptors are also found in the large intracranial vessels, for example, the circle of Willis. These are likely involved in pain in a variety of intracranial processes, such as mass lesions. Most nociceptors, wherever they're found, send information that's interpreted as pain within higher centers of the nervous system. Their job is to detect stimuli that are likely to signal possible or actual damage to your body. In simpler terms, nociceptors are a defense mechanism. Their basic job is to send a message about an event that's harming your body. So let's look at how that message travels through the body all the way to the brain. We'll call this the descending pain modulatory system the DPMS for short. The nociceptive nerve endings and the nerves that carry the pain signals are part of the peripheral nervous system. When we talk about the peripheral nervous system, we're referring to all of the 100 billion neurons found outside the brain and spinal cord. These neurons align into long branching networks of nerve fibers. Groups of interwoven nerve fibers are called plexuses. These plexuses eventually lead to the spine, which leads to the brainstem and the other major structures of the brain. When nociceptors detect damage, they send electrical impulses up the nerve pathways toward the spine until they encounter a specialized type of nerve cell called an interneuron. These interneurons connect multiple nerves at the spine and they act like gates controlling which messages get through to the deeper structures of the spine and brain. Imagine this for a moment. You're walking through your living room, and you bang your leg on the coffee table. You've probably done that once or twice, right? What happens next? If you're like most people, almost instinctively, you reach down and start rubbing the point of impact. And in a few seconds, it'll start to feel better. What happened here? Remember that the nociceptors are sitting side by side with other sensory neurons, the ones that in this case are detecting pressure and warmth. When you rub the injured spot, the messages from the other sensory neurons overwhelm the messages from the nociceptors. We say that the interneuron opened the gate to the comfortable sensations and closed the gate to the painful stimulus. 
This is called the gate control theory of pain. And we'll see later on, it has important implications for pain control. So let's dive deeper into that bruised leg, for example. You bang your leg against a coffee table, and the nociceptors in the area send a pain message through the nearest peripheral nerve toward your spinal cord. At the spinal cord, specifically in a part of your spinal cord called the dorsal horn, it encounters that inner neuron, that gating cell. Their inner neuron decides it's important, and it lets the message through. The spine has three important jobs in managing the pain signal. First, it manages your automatic motor responses to pain by sending the appropriate signal to the motor neurons near the site of injury. Touch a hot stove, the spine tells you to jerk your hand away. Get bitten by a mosquito, the spine makes you swat at it. Or as in our example, bang your leg on the coffee table, the spine makes you halt in your tracks. The next thing your spine does is it sorts through all the different signals from your peripheral nervous system and it prioritizes them. That gate control system of inner neurons isn't just for pain. It's at work in our bodies all the time, sorting and routing all the signals we receive from our sensory nerves. The spine adds chemical modulation to these signals, upgrading some and downgrading others. And finally, once all that sorting and prioritizing is done, the spine sends the signal on to your brain. The brain is where pain becomes extraordinarily complex because it's no longer just a physical phenomena. The emotional and cognitive centers of the brain get involved as well. The pain signal's first stop in the brain is the thalamus. The thalamus consists of two roughly egg-shaped structures, one in each hemisphere of the brain, that sit right above your brainstem. They act sort of like a junction box or a switching station, routing sensory input to all the other parts of the brain, specifically to the somatosensory cortex, the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus. Let's look first at the somatosensory cortex, the physical sensation region. The somatosensory cortex is a band of neurons in the cerebrum that runs from ear to ear over the top portion of your brain like a headband. This region processes all incoming sensory information, not just pain signals. Different areas of the cortex correspond to different areas of the body, as well as different types of information. This is how you know where you're injured and the type of injury. Is it burning, cutting, stinging, or any other type of pain? The limbic system, on the other hand, is where the brain processes emotions. Someone's initial emotional reaction to pain may be obvious. Do they cry out? Do they jump? Do they shrug it off? Now, you might think this is an objective measurement of the severity of the pain. Most of us would, for example, cry out if we got burned or slap away a mosquito and move on with our day. But as it turns out, it's not that simple. An individual's prior painful experiences can affect the perception of pain. Take one very common example. How do you feel about the dentist? How'd you feel when I asked that? If you have strong, healthy teeth and you haven't had any bad experience in the dentist chair, you probably just shrugged. If you've had a lot of work done, maybe your heartbeat just sped up just a little, or your fingers clenched. That little touch of fear that you just experienced can actually make even a routine dental cleansing feel more painful, just because you're anticipating pain. Which brings me to the second job of the limbic system, regulating the endocrine hormones and autonomic nerves. That means that pain signals received by the limbic system can ultimately affect your heart rate, your breathing, as we just saw. It may make you agitated or tired, dizzy or nauseated, anxious or enraged. But through controlling heart rate, it also controls the flow of blood, which sends pain-suppressing chemicals and tissue-repairing factors, such as white blood cells and platelets, to the site of injury, helping initiate the healing process. The third essential function of the limbic system is forming memories, all sorts of memories. Not just memories of pain, but pain memories can be important. They're how we learn that fire will burn us, that thorns will prick us, that knives can cut us, and so forth. And while those pain memories can do us some harm, like making us anxious at the dentist, overall they exist to keep us out of harm's way. Our feelings and memories of pain interact with that third region of the brain I mentioned a little while ago, the frontal cortex. Essentially, this is where thinking and learning take place. 
This is the part of you that knows you hate the dentist. It's also the part of you that makes that dentist appointment anyway and brings along a stress ball to squeeze. In other words, the way you think about pain controls how much pain you expect to feel in any given situation, as well as what you do about it. And in this way, your frontal cortex can raise or lower your response to pain. These and many more unique features of your physiology and personality, from your attention span to your overall health to your cultural attitudes, can affect the way your brain processes pain. It's an incredibly complicated and individual process. So I'm not being facetious or dismissive when I say that pain really is in your head. There's no way to disentangle the tissue damage that causes pain from your brain's experience of it. But I bet if you're living with pain or have experienced severe pain, it's an experience you feel you could have lived without. Unfortunately, that's not really true. Pain, at least acute pain, is essential to our survival. How do we know this? Well, at the start of this lecture, I said that everyone experiences pain, but that's not quite true. With my colleagues in Rochester, I once had the opportunity to study a young man in his 20s who was diagnosed with a congenital idiopathic inability to perceive pain. This means he was unable to feel pain as most of us do. A glance at this young man's history of injuries reveals the very real problems of a life lived without pain. In one particularly vivid example, his hand was slammed in a car door, breaking numerous bones, but neither he nor anyone else in his family noticed for hours. The bones in his hands are now crooked because of that. He had many more injuries like this over the years, all because he didn't know he was hurt. So acute pain's main function is to alert us to injury and get us to do something about it. But what about chronic pain? Chronic pain is typically defined as persistent pain lasting for three months or longer. Unlike acute pain, which usually has a very obvious cause, chronic pain's cause may or may not be obvious. It can result from ongoing tissue damage. It can persist after an injury or illness has triggered the pain has healed. And it can occur in the absence of any evidence of illness or injury. It makes sense that ongoing damage would cause pain, but what about the latter two cases? Why does a person still experience pain once the damage has healed or when there seems to be no damage in the first place? This has long been one of the great mysteries of neuroscience. For far too long, people who complained of pain that had no apparent cause were called hypochondriacs or attention seekers. However, we now know this is not the case. This type of chronic pain is absolutely real. Maybe you or someone you know has undergone an MRI magnetic resonance imaging. MRIs use the magnetic properties of the human body in combination with radio waves to excite the hydrogen atoms within the body. Different tissues have different hydrogen content and they respond to these waves at different frequencies. A computer then interprets these frequencies into a series of images, each one showing a thin slice of the body. MRI images have helped us see how experiences change our brains in all sorts of ways. Take, for example, a concert pianist. Hours and hours of practice every day lead not only to greater physical skill, but to greater mental skill. After all, it's a part of the brain, that somatosensory cortex that hears the music, and another part, the motor cortex, that controls the movement of the pianist's fingers. In time, the penis brain becomes hardwired to play a particular song. And we can see the changes that hardwiring makes in the musician's brain on certain types of MRI scans. The neurologist term for this phenomena is neuroplasticity. As with practice, so with pain. In pain studies, we can see structural differences between the brains of pain-free subjects and patients with particular types of chronic pain doesn't matter whether you can attribute this pain to tissue damage or not, the brain changes are real. Something has hardwired the patient's brain for pain. In some cases, chronic pain results from damage that lingers from an injury, infection, or even a surgery that's already healed. We call this type of chronic pain neuropathic pain, and there are two general types. There's peripheral neuropathy and centrally mediated pain. As you can probably guess by now, peripheral neuro neuropathy indicates damage within the peripheral nervous system. 
and centrally mediated pain indicates damage within the central nervous system, the brain, or the spine. One of the most common forms of neuropathic pain is diabetic peripheral neuropathy. Over time, high blood sugar results in nerve damage, most often to nociceptors in the feet and legs. Patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy will often feel numbness, tingling, or burning in their limbs, which seems worse at night. They can experience cramping as well, or an increased sensitivity to touch. Clothing and bed sheets can be excruciatingly painful. We call this allodynia. Their strength and reflexes diminish, as does their balance and coordination. And just like the young man with congenital analgesia, this hyperalgesia, this increased sensitivity to pain, prevents the patient from recognizing when real damage is occurring, resulting in infections and other damage. So why does this happen? Well, currently, this is still an open area of research. We do know that when a nerve is physically cut, the severed end can sprout a tangle of disorganized nerve fibers called a neuroma. Neuromas do not play by the usual rules. They send signals spontaneously. They don't follow the usual checks and balances of the gating system. So neuromas, or something very like them, could be one reason for the false pain signals in disorders like diabetic neuropathy. But if there's no known neurological damage, what then? Well, one theory is that these patients are experiencing a disorder called central sensitization. Central sensitization, like most of the processes we've been discussing, is a fairly complex biological process, but we can visualize it with a pretty straightforward analogy. When pain signals are transmitted from injured or diseased tissue, other nerves can be activated or sensitized by the signal. It's a lot like turning up the volume on your stereo. If it's loud enough, the floor will shake, the walls, the furniture, and the sound will even start to distort. Somehow in these patients, the volume has been turned up on their pain, causing other neural circuits to send pain signals. One of the best known examples of central sensitization is phantom limb syndrome, in which a person can feel intense pain in a body part that is no longer there. Central sensitization can affect more than just the nociceptors. It can turn up the volume on all your senses, making all kinds of sensations very difficult to tolerate. Patients with what we call central sensitization can be extremely sensitive to smells, to lights, to sounds. They can have sensitive digestive systems. They're often exhausted because everything they experience is simply overwhelming. The exact mechanism that causes sensitization is not yet understood but a great deal of research is being devoted to finding both the cause and appropriate treatments for this kind of pain. We believe that understanding sensitization will help us better understand and better treat all types of pain. In the meantime, what do we know about managing pain, especially chronic pain? Well, as we already discussed in the previous lecture, we know that long-term opioid therapy is no longer considered a safe choice for chronic pain treatment. There are other medicines available just not just in the form of a pill either. We'll discuss the pros and cons of these in a future lecture. But to me, the most interesting and promising areas of research are the ones that don't involve a pharmacy. In 2008, First Lieutenant Sam Brown was serving with the United States Army in Kandahar, Afghanistan. During a routine security mission, his Humvee struck an IED. The vehicle rolled over and Lieutenant Brown's entire body was engulfed in fire. By the time the flames were out, the lieutenant had third-degree burns over 30% of his body. To get Lieutenant Brown through the extraordinarily painful process of wound debridement, burn healing, physical therapy, and skin grafts, he was on a combination of synthetic opioid medications and morphine. The problem was it wasn't working, at least not all the time. The wound cleaning and physical therapy often spiked his pain to an eight or a nine, or even a 10 out of 10 on a pain scale. But raising the dose of his medicine could be dangerous. That's when a pair of pain psychologists named Hunter Hoffman and David Patterson entered the picture. Dr. Hoffman is an expert in cognitive psychology, in other words, in patterns of thinking. He'd been exploring the possibilities of virtual reality for use in a therapeutic setting pretty much since it'd been invented back in the 1980s. Dr. Patterson is a specialist in the use of hypnosis for pain control, especially for use in burn patients. 
In the 1990s, they combined their efforts. They now work together at the Virtual Reality Analgesia Research Center at the University of Washington Human Interface Technology Laboratory, called HITLAB for short. Based on Dr. Hoffman's original program, Spider World, which was used to treat people with arachnophobia, they developed a virtual reality program called Snow World. The premise sounds almost too good to be true. The burn patient wears a pair of virtual reality goggles and usually has some sort of control device similar to one you'd find on any video game system. And inside the goggles, they see a cartoon world full of adorable penguins and snowmen. And the patient goes sliding down an icy canyon and has a snowball fight with these cute creatures. So what do you think? Is that going to do any good? Believe it or not, it did. Instead of hitting a 9 or a 10, Lieutenant Brown says the pain of wound cleaning only hit a 6 while he was in the cooling virtual world. Not perfect, maybe, but certainly the difference between intolerable and tolerable. How is that possible? It's possible because even though pain is real, it exists partially as an electrical signal in your mind. And your mind can be taught to respond to that pain signal differently. The key in this case is attention. If you're a parent, you've probably had the experience of distracting your child while trying to remove a splinter or bandage a scraped knee, right? Well, it's the same principle on a much larger scale. Virtual reality seems to take some portion of our attention, attention that would otherwise be focused on pain, and divert it. It turns down the volume on the pain signals, not by changing the pain itself, but by changing what you're focused on. To complete the metaphor, if you're having a conversation, you're not listening to the loud music. Some researchers are integrating virtual reality with biofeedback in programs like COOL to enhance mindfulness and resilience. As virtual reality becomes more mainstream, with some basic commercial systems costing less than $1,000, we can expect this kind of therapy to start turning up in a clinical setting soon. But much more work needs to be done in the use of virtual reality technology in chronic pain, as opposed to the acute pain suffered by burn victims. One of the challenges in the mo is the motion sickness many people experience in a virtual reality environment, sometimes called simulator sickness or cyber sickness. It's a queasiness that's been attributed to your brain, noticing a discrepancy between what you're seeing and what you're feeling. If you're walking through a room in the virtual reality space without actually walking at all in three-dimensional space, your vestibular system is going to protest. Mayo Clinic scientists have been working on this problem for more than a decade, and they've come up with something called galvanic stimulator technology, or GVS, to treat it. Galvanic vestibular stimulation, or GVS, is a technique that stimulates the inner ear to produce or control the sensation of motion. Mayo Clinic researchers have found a patented way to synchronize this inner ear stimulation with what you see on a movie screen or through a gaming device so you actually feel the motion you're seeing in real time. This completely transforms the entertainment experience into something you feel, not just see or hear. Here's how it works. Stimulators are placed on the forehead, on the back of the neck and behind both ears, as you see here lighting up in green on this animated model. A small electric pulse strategically timed to specific intervals in the movie or game with a proprietary algorithm will emit from those points to make you feel like you're part of the action you're seeing. GVS has the ability to make you feel like you are rotating to the left or rotating to the right, moving forward, moving backwards, or spinning around, all without leaving your seat. And because GVS technology is perfectly synced to the movie or gaming through a proprietary algorithm, you won't experience any of the virtual reality sickness in the process. Applications for GVS are expected to go beyond the entertainment domain. Mayo researchers have proven GVS can mitigate simulator sickness and spatial disorientation among pilots. The technology may also one day treat people with various balance disorders and vertigo. Of course, if you're in pain all the time, you can't walk around with a pair of goggles on all day. For most people, taking this course, the lesson here is not necessarily about the therapy itself. It's about the way that the nervous system can be redirected or retrained to control and reduce the pain experience. Virtual reality units like this one work on the central nervous system, the brain itself, but it's also possible to alter the pain experience in the peripheral nervous system, again, without the use of heavy medicines. Remember that pain, like any nerve signal, is an electrical phenomena. 
that got researchers thinking. If it's an electrical problem, is electricity the solution? Like with so many questions we have about pain, the answer turns out to be maybe. Perhaps you've seen ads for TENS units, or you may have a friend who used one. TENS is an acronym. It stands for Transcutaneous Electrical Nerve Stimulation. These little devices come in a few different shapes and sizes, but they're usually about the size of a smartphone. Sometimes a little bigger, but usually they fit in the palm of your hand, like your smartphone sometimes does. They have wires dangling from them, except instead of headphones, these cords are electrodes. You attach the electrodes to your skin near the site of your pain. Your back, your head, your abdomen, your knee, wherever it hurts. And then you use the phone size part of the device to send a small, painless, but definitely noticeable electrical signal through your skin to the nerves near the site of pain. Through the skin, that's the transcutaneous part. There are several different theories about what happens next. One is that the electricity stimulates production of endorphins. Again, those are your body's natural pain-killing chemicals. Another theory is based on the gay control theory of pain we discussed earlier. Remember how, when you banged your leg on the coffee table, rubbing your leg disrupted the pain signals? The electrical signals from the TENS unit may do the same thing. They may disrupt the pain signals from your nociceptors, overwhelming that signal with a different kind of stimulation. Now, like virtual reality, TENS can't work miracles, it also doesn't work for everyone, but it's interesting to researchers because it's further support for gate control. And like virtual reality, it points us in the direction of further research. We can disrupt pain signals without medication. Your nerves can be retrained temporarily for now, maybe for longer periods of time in the future. What does all this mean for someone like a practitioner in a pain clinic? Do I use either of these therapies in my day-to-day -day work? No, I don't. Not because they're not good therapies, though. Most of my patients have already tried a TENS unit and found that a single treatment or modality was simply not enough to combat the severe pain and the impact it had caused their lives. From my perspective, what the success of these therapies does mean is this. When we treat pain, we need to treat the mind as well as the body. Pain rehabilitation is a multidisciplinary process. It reaches beyond the realm of what you do and say in the doctor's office and into every aspect of your life. So as we move further into this course, we're not only going to be addressing physical habits, but habits of mind as well. These aren't just the usual topics that we think of as falling under the umbrella of mood or emotion, like depression, anxiety, grief, or anger, although we'll address those too. We're going to address the way you respond to your pain with activities such as sleep, breathing, meditation, social interaction, and other sorts of behavioral changes. That's how the most effective pain control programs work. They address the body, they address the mind, and they address the way the body and the mind interact. But before we go there, we're going to stick with the body a little longer. Next time, we're going to take a look at the most common forms of chronic pain.